Notice the title of my message, What Can We Be Certain About? Would you stand for the reading of God's word? Beginning at verse 13, 1 John chapter 5. John writes, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. This is the assurance we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we've asked of him. If anyone sees his brother commit a sin that does not lead to death, we should pray and God will give him life. I refer to those whose sin does not lead to death. There is a sin that leads to death. I'm not saying that he should pray about that. All wrongdoing is sin, and there is sin that does not lead to death. We know that anyone born of God does not continue to sin. The one who was born of God keeps him safe, and the evil one does not touch him. We know that we are children of God, that the whole world is under the control of the evil one. We know also that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true. And we are in him who is true, even his Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. Dear children, keep yourselves from idols. Father, we just thank you again for your word, for your spirit. We just lift these things up to you. We ask you, Lord, give us wisdom this morning. Speak into our hearts and minds. Help us to know what your will is for each life. We pray, Lord, too, that you would pour out your spirit and revival in our community, in our neighborhoods, even in our own homes. And, Lord, that you'd be glorified. We love you this morning. Again, we pray your kingdom come and your will be done. Amen, church? You may be seated. I have a news flash for you. Life in this fallen world is filled with certainty or uncertainty. Yeah, really. Job says it interestingly. He says, man born of woman is of few days and full of trouble. Man is born to trouble as surely as sparks fly upward. There are few, if any, guarantees in this life. Little can be depended on. Illnesses, accidents, violence, or simply old age. These things catch up with everyone in the end, don't they? Because all of us are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes, James reminds us. So life's journey is full of doubts, full of questions, and uncertainties. Jobs disappear as companies maybe downsize or outsource. The volatility of the stock market, fluctuations in the economy, tax policies create further uncertainty. Relationships come and go with people's faithfulness often lasting only as long as their felt needs are being met or until they find someone more attractive. On a larger scale, natural disasters, earthquakes, hurricanes, tornadoes, fires, as we've witnessed in Hawaii, floods, these things can sweep away in an instant the accumulated treasures of a lifetime. Isn't that true? Uncertainty over the future drives us to make sure we have enough insurance. Some of us are insurance poor. House insurance, earthquake insurance, car insurance, life insurance, health insurance, and on and on and on it goes. But I would suggest the most profound uncertainty with the most disastrous results exists not in the material realm but in the spiritual realm. Because people reject the gospel, Paul tells us they are without God and without hope. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 12. 
Remember that at that time, you were separate from Christ. That means before we were believers, before we came to faith, before God granted us repentance and salvation. We were excluded from the citizenship in Israel, foreigners to the covenants of the promise. Notice this, without hope and without God in the world. That's our, that was our condition. That's the condition of so, so many people today. Most people, quite frankly, put their hope in false religions. Most people put their hope in philosophies or uh, their own personal ideologies. All in an effort to get some sense of certainty and guarantee that there, if there is an afterlife, uh, that they will get into that happy eternal state. No guarantees. It's popularly believed that all religions lead to heaven. Have you ever heard that? All roads lead to heaven. No, they don't. No, they don't. And most people, when you ask them if they would go to heaven, if they die, if they would go to heaven, their response typically would be, I, I, I hope so, I think so. You ask them why. On what basis would you go to heaven? They say, well, I'm a good person. I don't rape, pillage, and plunder. I know I do sin, but, but, but. Can't minimize it, can you? I love when people tell me I'm a good person. I said, really? <laughs> By what standard? If you think you're going to go to heaven based on good works, how many good works do you have to do? Well, you know, I just, I try to do as many as I can. But what if you're one short? Bummer. <laughs> and it's too late. What is not popular is the reality that only the Bible is the true word of God. Only the Bible. The more I read my Bible, and I've been reading my Bible for close to 50 years, the more I read it, the more I love it. If you come this afternoon, you'll see my wife's Bible. It is so marked up, so written in, prayers on, on every page. Astonishing. The gospel is the only way to heaven, and all who don't believe it go to hell forever. There's no candy coating it. Can't do that. That's the reality. That's the truth. In a world of uncertainty, in a world of relativism, in a world of deception, the Bible proclaims absolute truth and certainty. You can take it to the bank, if I can use that expression. Jesus said what? I tell you the truth. The Bible reveals the truth about how the universe began and how it will end. The Bible reveals the truth about why people behave the way they do. The Bible reveals the truth about what is right and what is wrong. The Bible reveals the truth about heaven and hell and how people get to those places. The Bible reveals the truth about what makes for good human relationships. The Bible reveals the truth about God's promises. And most significant, the Bible reveals the truth about the Lord Jesus Christ. It reveals to us the fact of his, his birth, a virgin birth, his sinless life, his unparalleled teaching, his substitutionary death, his literal resurrection, his bodily ascension, and his second coming. He is coming back. Somebody say hallelujah. <laughs> now John writes this letter to provide his readers with a certainty about all that God has revealed concerning salvation. Look with me again at verse 13 of our passage. He says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. Verse 13 reminds us of the end of John's gospel when he writes this. He said he wrote his gospel so those who would read it might believe in Jesus and receive eternal life in his name. 
He writes his gospel, and then his letter here, which we have been studying since the end of April, his letter is addressed to those who have believed, but still need assurance that through the name of Jesus, they have indeed received eternal life. So these people to whom John writes, they had become a bit unsettled. Unsettled by false teachers and false teaching regarding Jesus, the person of Jesus. And as a result, they become uncertain of their spiritual status. So he writes to them to confirm this for them. The false teachers presented a different Jesus. They presented a different knowledge, a different spiritual knowledge. They presented a different lifestyle. If you don't believe in the Jesus of the Bible your lifestyle is going to be uh, different than you would normally be if you believed in the Jesus of the Bible. Jesus says, this is how you should walk. So if you don't believe in the right Jesus, then you're going to walk differently. Does that make sense? So while the false teachers are teaching these things, John counters with a series of tests by which believers can evaluate the false teachers, the false teaching, and what they actually do believe, their practices. Believing Jesus is, in fact, the Son of God. That's critical. Believing Jesus is the Son of God. Walking in the light. Obeying his commands. Loving one's brothers. Being steadfast in the community of faith. Doing what is right. All of these dynamics serve as tests of whether the life that is from God has been received or not. You and I just look at our own life. What, 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 how am I living? What am I believing? Am I involved or not? Am I in the periphery? Do I come to church once in a while? Am I involved in committed community and fellowship? What am I doing? And if these dynamics are not dynamically involved in your life and you're not involved in them, you have reason to believe there's some wobbliness to your faith. You may or may not, in fact, be a Christian. Isn't it good to double check ourselves? So when salvation has been received, it is only because God's witness to his own son as the source of that life has been accepted and believed. I believe. We sang that song earlier. This is what we believe. We believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God. John says, in effect, in verse 13, we just read, this letter is to assure you that you have eternal life. If you put together John's gospel and his letter here, John's purpose is played out in four stages. First, that his readers should hear. That's the gospel. His readers should hear. And then hearing, they should believe. And believing, they should live. And living, they should know. They should know that they have eternal life. Eternal life doesn't, by the way, refer primarily to duration of life, but to equality of life. It's a quality of life. Do we enjoy fellowship here? Do we enjoy what God provides for us here in terms of our spiritual life? Imagine perfection. Imagine perfection. Imagine no hindrances. No, no more arguments. No more disagreements. No more bumps in the road with each other. Just perfect fellowship. It's quality of life. Perfect life, not an imperfect life. Eternal life is to know Jesus Christ. Not just know about him. Eternal life is to know Jesus Christ, who himself is eternal life, and that we share in his life. That's why Paul, when he writes his letters, he says, in Christ, in Christ, in Christ. Implication is we are sharing in his life. And that life is a present possession. 
It's not merely a future hope, though in this life it's not yet fully manifested. But there will be a time, if I can even use that word, when eternal life that we, we possess as believers now, that eternal life will no longer be incarcerated in these fallible, broken, limited bodies that we live in. We set free. Won't that be exciting? Absolutely. Absolutely. My wife is enjoying that right now. On that glorious day, we will experience fully our adoption as sons, as Paul says, the redemption of our bodies. Look at Romans chapter 8, verse 23 with me. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we await eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. Have you ever found yourself going, oh man, come on, Lord. Philippians chapter 3, verse 21. But our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so they will be like his glorious body. Awesome, huh? What a promise. 1 John chapter 3, verse 2. Dear friends, Now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. You see, then the glory of the eternal life will shine through us, unclouded by our mortal bodies. And though the full experience of eternal life awaits us in heaven, we presently, presently have access to all God's resources We presently have access to all God's resources. Through what agency do we have access to all his resources? He tells us prayer, prayer, prayer. Look at verse 14 with me. This is the assurance we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. This is the assurance, this is the confidence that we have, access to all of God's resources. Through Jesus Christ, we have assured, confident, bold access to God. Wow. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16. Let us then approach the throne of grace with what? Confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Is that a marvelous promise? Oh, God. The sure promise of God is that we can boldly and freely come to him with our requests, and he will hear and he will answer. Verses 14 and 15 again. This is the assurance we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we've asked him. Look at all the uses of the word know in that passage. You want to underline them in your Bible. The hearing that John speaks about in this context refers to more than merely God's being aware of our requests. How many parents do we have? Your kids make requests of you? All the time. And most of the time, we're aware of their requests, right? (laughs) They're just kind of out of sight, out of mind. I know, I know, I know. But the hearing in this context refers to more than merely God's being aware of our requests. It means that he grants our requests. There is, however, one qualifier. What's the one qualifier? The request must be according to his will. Whoa. To pray according to God's will assumes, first of all, that you are a Christian, that you are saved. Newsflash, God is not obligated to answer the prayers of unbelievers. He may choose to do so when it suits his sovereign purpose, but God does not obligate himself to any unbeliever. 
John illustrated this in chapter 3, verses 21 and 22. And the point being of this passage is that obedience leads to confidence. Dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God. Implication is, I've been obedient. And receive from him anything we ask because we obey his commands and do what pleases him. Do you see that? Jesus makes a similar statement in his gospel, in John's gospel, in chapter 15, verse 7. If you remain in me, my words remain in you. Ask whatever you wish, and it will be given you. The implication of remaining in him and his words remaining in us is the, is the whole idea that we are obedient. We do what he says. We buy in. Only believers, those who obey God's commands, can have the certainty that their prayers will be answered. That make it pretty clear, doesn't it? If I'm disobedient, can I have certainty that God's going to answer my prayers? No, no. Praying according to God's will also means confessing sin, something that's very often overlooked in people's lives. In Psalm 66, verse 18, David says, If I had cherished sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. Part of our, our prayer life is to first examine ourselves, isn't it? And to come and say, Lord, I just need to confess some stuff. I want to, I want to clear, the, clear the space, get, get, things, get things straight with us before I bring my requests. We do that in our own human relationships, don't we? We tell people, you know, I want to make sure that our relationship is good. I have some requests, but I want to, I want to fess up to some stuff. There's a special word to husbands. Peter mentions this, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7. Husbands, be considerate as you live with your wives. By the way, this is in the mode of command. Most husbands are not considerate as they live with their wives. They have to be commanded to be considerate. Treat them with respect as the weaker partner, as heirs with you, the gracious gift of life, so that what? Nothing will hinder your prayers. That's a good word for all of us husbands, isn't it? Amen. Yes. And potential husbands. Again, the Lord's promise in John chapter 14 affirms the requirement of praying according to God's will. Listen to what Jesus says. I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Son may bring glory to the Father. You may ask for anything in my name, and I will do it. Is that a blank check? Well, in a sense, it is, as long as we're asking according to his will. To pray in Jesus' name, what does that mean? Does it mean that we put that suffix on the end of every prayer? We end the prayer in Jesus' name. It's a formula, right? What does it mean to pray in Jesus' name, do you think? It means to pray cons with consistency in terms of who he is and what he wants. Am I in tune with him? With who he is? And with what he wants. All with the glory of bringing, all with the goal of bringing him glory. What's, what's, remember his model prayer in Matthew's gospel? When the disciples said, Master, teach us to pray. He said, pray this way. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Your kingdom come. Lord, if my will is not in accord with yours, don't answer my prayer. I thank God over the years that he's, most all my prayers, he's not answered. In his grace and mercy, he's protected me from my prayers. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah. <laughs> Don't forget his own example in the garden. He's about ready to go to the cross. He's in the garden of Gethsemane. He falls down three times, and he says, in effect, can we do this another way? But then he amends that by saying, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. 
The goal of prayer is not to gratify our own desires, our own selfish appetites, but to align our wills with God's purpose. We pray, we pray because we want to know him. That's why you pray with your Bible open. You read. God, I want to know how you think. I want to know what you want. I want to pray in concert with what your will is. James chapter 4, verse 3. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your own pleasures. Truth be known, most of our prayers are self-oriented, aren't they? Gimme, 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 gimme. And we pray pious prayers and we think that that makes them better. Praying according to God's will not only brings glory to the Son, but also joy to us as believers. When you're, when you're in that groove, when you're right in there with God, it results in joy in our own life. Listen to what Jesus says in John 16. I tell you the truth. My Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. Until now, you have not asked for anything in my name. Ask and you will receive and your what? Joy will be complete. You know you're right there with him. You know there's nothing more joyful to know than you're right there with him. And when we delight ourselves in the Lord, he tells us he will plant the desires in our hearts for what glorifies him. We've all read Psalm 37, verse 4. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Oh, yeah, yeah if I did love he'd give me that Cadillac. <laughs> no, 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 no. He plants his desires in our hearts. When you delight in him, he plants. It means you're accessible. You're open. I'm delighting in you. I want what you want. He says, oh, great. Now I can plant my desires and my will in your heart. And beloved, those desires now control and direct our prayers. Isn't that wonderful? God's answers to these prayers will glorify him, bring our wills in line with his purposes, and fill us with joy. What more could we want than that? God, I want your will. I want your will. I want what you want. Look at verses 16 and 17 with me in our passage. If anyone sees his brother commit a sin that does not lead to death, he should pray and God will give him life. Now he's, he's transitioning here from um, assurance in prayer to a ministry of prayer. So it's, it's not a different subject. He's just transitioning. I refer to those whose sin does not lead to death. There is a sin that leads to death. I am not saying that he should pray about that. All wrongdoing is sin, and there is sin that does not lead to death. Now, if love requires, think with me, if love requires the willingness to lay down one's life for our brother, does it? Did Jesus do that? We follow his example? Yes. Then it should follow that if we see a brother commit a sin, we should be obligated then to intercede for our brother or our sister. Would you agree? If we're to lay our life down, and we see them involved in sin, we should intercede for this. this is what the Bible tells us. Now for John, it would be obvious that not to pray for a brother or a sister would be as much a betrayal of God's love as to withhold material aid when it's needed. Look at what he says in chapter 3, verse 17. This is how we, if anyone has a material possession, sees his brother in need, has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? So if I, if I know that my brother or sister is in sin and I'm not praying for them, I'm not interceding on their behalf, it's tantamount to me not even taking care of their material needs. Does that make sense? We cannot say, am I my brother's keeper and do nothing? 
When we pray for a brother or sister who commits sin, we can know that that prayer that we are praying is according to God's will. Why? Because he tells us right here. Will he answer that prayer? Absolutely. Absolutely. Throughout John's letter, he's been warning his readers against falling into sin. He's been stressing that habitual sin especially is the characteristic of those not born of God, people who are not born again. He's drawn the line between believers and unbelievers in this letter as clearly as possible. Now, as he attempts to reassure his leaders that they are, in fact, children of God, the question of their sin arises once more, saying that the prayers of believers can secure life for their brothers and sisters when they fall into sin. Secure life. I believe what he means by that is not that they've lost their salvation and they get salvation life back. They're already saved. But secure life, I think what he's talking about is restored fellowship with God. In effect, when you and I sin, we in effect turn our back on God. We're doing our own thing. Does he ever leave? Does he turn his back? No, we do. We say, eh, I'm going to do my thing. We turn our back. Fellowship needs to be restored. Isn't it wonderful if someone knows, a brother or sister knows that I'm doing that, and they come alongside, or at some distance they pray for me, they intercede for me, God, grant him repentance. Turn his heart back to you. And God wonderfully, wonderfully allows that fellowship to be restored between us. John emphasizes that this possibility applies only in the case of those whose sin does not lead to death. Apparently, there is the possibility of sin that does lead to death. And it is not about such sin that he recommends intercession. And then he reminds his readers in verse 17 that all wrongdoing is sin But nevertheless, there is a kind of sin which does not lead to death. So there's a basic problem here. He mentions two kinds of sin. A sin that does not lead to death and a sin that does lead to death. Does that create anybody a problem? Yeah, that's that's a difficult, awkward passage. In the Old Testament, there were unintentional sins and intentional sins. The unintentional sins were sins that were committed, that there were sacrifices that would cover over the sinner's guilt. The intentional sins required the death penalty. So in the Old Testament, you read through it, you read through the Mosaic Law, you see that there were sins that people commit required the death penalty. No negotiation, no sacrifice could be offered. They lost their life. If you go in the New Testament, we see a couple more of examples. How many remember lovely Ananias and Sapphira? That wonderful couple in the first century church. What did they do? They lied to God. About what? Money. You don't want to lie to God about money. You want to be as open as you know how to be about what he resources you with, right? They lied to God. What happened to them? He killed them on the spot. An object lesson to the early church. You think that terrified everybody? Luke says it did. They went, whoa, I'm going to be cool with money. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul talks about taking communion in an unworthy manner. Unworthy manner, whatever that means. I mean, there were some people who at their love feasts were getting drunk. There are some people who disregarded the poorer people in the group. There were some people who went ahead and ate without regard to anybody else. No manners. An unworthy manner can cover a whole bunch of things. But he says to them, whoever eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. 
Man ought to examine himself before he eats the bread and drinks the cup. Anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on himself. This is why many among you are weak and sick, and a number of you have fallen asleep. A euphemism have died. But if we judged ourselves, we would not come under judgment. So you, you've got people in the, in, the, in the first century church, in the church in Corinth, come to the Lord's table and they've not examined themselves. They're coming in an unworthy manner. And God, quite frankly, kills them. This is why we always examine ourselves before we take the, take the elements, true? Throughout his letter, John is most concerned about the sins which are incompatible with being a child of God. These can be summed up in denial of Jesus, his person, being the Son of God. It can be summed up in a refusal to obey God's commands to love, loving the world, hatred of one's brothers. As you read through Paul's letter, you see all of these things he points out. And they're all incompatible with being truly a born-again Christian. These are sins characteristic of someone belonging to the sphere of darkness, not to the sphere of light. There's always going to be people who sit in the congregation. I don't care what century. I don't care what church. There's always going to be people sitting there thinking they're Christians. But to, you see, you have to say, what's the fruit in that person's life? Of course, this leads us to the conclusion that by sin that leads to death, John means the sins that are incompatible with being a child of God. The person who consciously and deliberately chooses the way that leads to death will surely die. It's a deliberate refusal to believe in Jesus Christ, to believe that he is the Son of God. Deliberate refusal to follow God's commands to love one another. These are all characteristic of the false teachers. They're all characteristic of, John describes, Antichrist. You're Antichrist. In Mark chapter 3, verse 29, Jesus describes the unforgivable sin. What's the unforgivable sin? Blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. What is that? That's simply denying supernatural works through God's spirit and attributing to the devil, which is what the Jewish leaders did. Is being born again a supernatural work of the Holy Spirit? Yeah, if you're denying the supernatural work of the Holy Spirit, you can never be born again because he's the agent through which we get born again. Hence, you can never be forgiven. Are you making, does that make sense? The book of Hebrews describes the spiritual death of the person who turns against Christ. Now, when you read Hebrews, you have to understand, there's a lot of debate about the book of Hebrews. The book of Hebrews really is addressing Hebrew believers and Hebrew people who profess to believers. So it's professing and possessing Jewish people in the first century, actually in the second century. And they have come under the umbrella, if you will, of Christianity. But persecution now comes against the church, and a lot of these Jewish, quote-unquote, believers run back to Judaism as a cover so they won't suffer persecution that the church is undergoing from the Roman Empire. That's the background and in, in context of the book of Hebrews. A lot of people misunderstand that and don't get that. Hebrews chapter 6 Verses 4 through 6, it is impossible, notice this, it is impossible for those who have once been enlightened. Now notice the language he uses, enlightened, tasted of the heavenly gift, shared in the Holy Spirit, tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the age to come. He's talking about there are people who've had a heavy, heavy, heavy exposure to the things of God. But it's impossible to renew them 
if they leave. You've had a heavy exposure. You should press on in. Press on in. But they choose not to. John, in our letter, is referring to those who had left the Christian fellowship and joined the Antichrist. They've had heavy exposure. They've been involved in the church. They sang the hymns. They prayed the prayers. They did all the stuff with the Christians. But you know what? They couldn't cross that line of belief, and they went with the Antichrist. By rejecting the only way of salvation, these people were putting themselves out of the reach of prayer. Notice, John says in verse 16, the last half of verse 16, I'm not saying that he should pray about that. Rather than you cannot pray about that. He recognizes the lack of certainty. I'm still going to pray for somebody. I got nothing to lose and neither do they. Right? He doesn't forbid me to pray. By contrast, sins that don't lead to death do not involve the rejection of God and his way of salvation. Sin is dangerous. Would you agree? Sin is dangerous. And it may move to the point of becoming habitual. We all understand what it means to to play with a little bit of sin. Well, it's not that big a deal. You know, I can kind of get away with this. Nobody really knows. Every little Effort to do that can lead to habitual sin. And with no repentance, you find yourself turning your back on God and ultimately on fellowship. This hurts the body. This hurts all of us. Because of this danger, it's essential. It's essential that we pray for one another that we confess our sins to one another. James chapter 5, verse 16, James says, confess your sins to each other. Pray for each other. This is what goes on in many churches, at least should go on in many churches to some extent. Otherwise, who are you confessing your sins to? Who are you accountable to? Who's praying for you? Who knows your struggle? So that you may be healed. Prayer of the righteous is powerful and effective. It's hard for us to be transparent. It's hard for us to be open with others. It's hard for us to confess our sins. The very thing we need to do. Our pride in the devil keeps us quiet. Keeps us quiet. When we pray for repentance, we have God's promise that he will hear our prayers and he will answer them. There's nothing more exciting than when you're praying for a brother. Brother says, pray for me. I'm doing this. I'm doing that. I need your prayers. I need your help. You pray for that person. And all of a sudden, they go, boom, I'm free. I repented. I confessed it. I'm back on track. Everybody rejoices. True? You know what I'm talking about. We are to be concerned about each other's spiritual well-being. We're to be concerned about each other's spiritual well-being so that we can enjoy life. We can all together have meaningful fellowship with God, not people left out on the periphery, not people alone. The church, the church should be a community of care, a community of love, a community of mercy, a community of grace, a community of forgiveness, a community of transparency, and a community of healing, shouldn't it? Paul says when one part of the body hurts, the whole body hurts. We all understand that. We all understand that. We've experienced that. Jesus said it very simply, love one another. That encompasses so much Love one another. I want to harken back to Colossians chapter 3. 
Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other. Forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Is that a marvelous, marvelous counsel for us? This is the church. This is who we are. This is who we should be evidencing. I want to close simply with John writing this thing again from verse 13. He says, I write these things to you, to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. Isn't God great? Oh, thank you, Lord. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for those you use to communicate it to us. Thank you for your spirit. Thank you for the truths of your word. Lord, thank you for these reminders that we need again and again and again. Father, as we anticipate your table, we pray, God, that uh, you would just guide us into those, whatever need we have to repent. Holy Spirit, search our hearts. If there's any hurtful way in us that we could Acknowledge it, confess it, repent of it. Lord, we want to come to your table in a worthy manner to bring you glory.